Hello, this is Evan Pitt, and I will be reading my book, All the Earth and Skies Above, a collection of poems, which I self-published in November of 2023. There are over 50 poems in here. They are an anthology of my creative energy over my adolescence, and I enjoy writing poems about nature, outer space, and the world that lives within each and every one of us. So that is the theme of this book. All the Earth and Skies Above is the title of one of the poems, which you will hear about later as I read it. The first poem is called A Tale for the Telling. A rich and vibrant flower has fallen from the tower, belonging to a woman who wishes for a man. She waits atop her spire for someone to admire, the beauty she possesses, the charm that she has claimed. She cannot seem to draw the gaze of men in awe. Perhaps her stay extends too far into the sky. But every day she tries again to meet the eyes of a man who'd fall in love with a woman like her. And sure enough, one day, a man called up to say, My dearest lady, spare me a look upon thy face. Her ears began to, began to ring. As her lungs began to sing, her heart did not stop racing, her eyes filled with delight. She ran to look outside. As she wiped a tear, she cried. She looked upon the man that she had been waiting for. My love, you are the wearer of the face that is the fair of the ones I've seen before, this man proclaimed to her. She knew it had been a while since a man had made her smile. She ran to get the door so he could come inside. I can't believe I've met you. So surely I should let you enchant me with your presence, she spoke in faintest voice. And since the day he knew her, that day he called up to her, they fell in love and lived a happy life as one. She's glad that she had waited, for she had never dated a man that rode to see her, a man that cared for her. This next poem is part of a series of four poems about the various seasons. This one is called Rebirth Springtime. The restlessness of winter has stopped with time to spare. Spring has sprung within the lungs of those who breathe its air. The burrowed mammals rise out of their homemade dens and hope to view the world in hues they wish they'd see again. The ones with ring wings return to chant with rhythmic poise where those who hear would lend an ear to something more than noise. The skies are lit like fire when evening casts its glow. Warming we who now break free from the bitter nip of snow. The favorite time of many has earned its reverent fame. Although it's fast and does not last, no season is the same. The spring we know and love with all its charm and grace has flooded in where winter's been through every barren place. This next one is part of a series of three poems about the sun, moon, and stars. This first one is called Luminary. Look unto the sun and squint, with warning comes her rays. Each morning beams of service sprint to brighten up our days. The walls of yesterday tumble on top of our regrets. The seasons make this climate humble, we're endlessly in debt. We owe much of who we are to what goes on outside. We'd never make this journey far without this cordial guide. How bright and rightfully it glows to aid us on our run. In rays of heaven we are clothed. We thank this pleasant sun. This next one is called, Here is Faith, Here is Hope, Here is Love. Here is faith that moved the mount, or gave us more than we could count. Here is faith that clothed the nude, who gave the hungry creels of food. Here is faith that rolled the stone, and rose the tenant to his throne. Here is faith that we'd proclaim the maker's unrestricted name. Here is hope that takes us up, calling then to wake us up. Here is hope appraising me, a wildfire blazing free. Here is hope that will not slumber, choosing never to encumber. Here is hope that seeds a crown to those who, tra who, to those who lay their troubles down. Here is love that will not boast, arriving when we need it most. Here is love that is quite rare, but always seems to be right there. Here is love that reconciles and meets us at our second mile. Here is love that waits for us, that opens up the gates for us. 
These next few poems are about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The first one is called A Crown on the Head. A ring of splinters pierced your skull. How could we place the human's fall straight upon your head? My blood, rather, should be bled. The enormity of scorn exists in each respective thorn. Though you wore it proud, I deserved it more. A woodworker's passion and craftsman's care. I will fit this diadem atop my lengthy hair. The blood that issued from your gown will trickle down my gown. Sorry, the blood that issued from your crown will trickle down my gown. Please accept this liberty you'd have gifted me. This next one is called A Nail in the Wrist. A type of metal rushed straight through your veins. The pain that they caused you should be injected into me and place me on that tree. A rusted shard of iron is the release of iron. You did not need to feel it. May it be my turn? A mallet in my hand and malice in my mind. I'll take these stakes out of your palms and drive them into mine. The blood you'd shed is mine instead. Take this freedom you would have given me. This next poem is called Commonalities, a poem for a close friend. We all have our favorite clothes, movies, books, and TV shows. Every now and then we find someone who shares a common mind. We talk about our own pursuits and who we are beneath our roots. Often do we grow as friends when we see through each other's lens. So we share our favorite song, hoping they will sing along. And if they don't, at least they heard each stunning sound and wondrous word. And by this time, we hope that we become the friends we hoped to be. We'll share about the days we've had, no matter if they're good or bad. We'll talk about our favorite things and all the joy that each one brings. We'll be so glad we met each other to share our lives with one another. No matter what, our common parts will keep us joined within our hearts. And in the end, we cannot lose the friend that walks inside our shoes. This one is called Fly Away, My Dear. It's written in two parts. This is part one. Upon the wall there rests a frame, and in the frame a letter. Please do not say you are to blame. Life will soon get better. You cherish this with more than might, with all your strength intact. It helped you rest throughout the night and taught you how to act. With sullen eyes from your depression, I still see a sign that underneath this keen aggression, everything is fine. I know there's more that I can't see or ever understand, but don't you once let go of me or never take my hand. Part 2 The clock still ticks and hourly chimes, and life still marches on. But I still count the many times that you were here, then gone. But the time, but this time I will not resist to chase you till I have you. For all those times that you were missed, there was something I could do. I'm sorry I refused to fight when you were bound by chains. Your words entangled me that night, and I too felt the pain. I know my voice has spoken lies in ages prior here. The truth is where your spirit flies, so fly away, my dear. This is the first of two poems entitled, In Peace I Will Cease My Speech. Silence is my grating voice. My lungs wish to belt out, to sing a song, to ring rejoice, for my tongue has not felt doubt. But here I rest, alone and hushed, my chest in still position, thinking of a life too rushed, too drawn on my ambition. It is in quiet time I hear, above the noise around, the subtle speaking in my ear, a voice of sweetest sound. Be it those of chirping birds or breezes overhead, I know that these booming words are those my Savior said. This next one is entitled, The Power of a Smile. One day I was in my garden. A man said, pardon me. I notice you're always smiling, which always brings me glee. I said, well, thank you, sir. Your comment made my day. And without another word, this man went on his way. He didn't need to say much to make me feel admired. And without knowing it, this man has made me feel inspired. It doesn't take a pair of shoes to go the extra mile. Sometimes it's just attitude, a great big simple smile. This is a poem. That is the name of the next poem. This is a poem. It is unlike any other poem I have written. 
because this one is different. It is different because it has words in a different order, and no other poem has words in this order. I changed the order of words to make this poem different. Someday I will write a poem different from this one, because it will not have the same order of words, just like all my other poems. If this is too confusing, I might have to explain it better. Just know that if you read a poem other than this one, it will be different. This poem is entitled, As You Spoke. As you spoke, the earth shook up. The paralyzed could now look up. Cattle crossed the ocean blue to hear the words that came from you. As you spoke, the law was good. All the tongues were understood. We wrote to friends the things you do the day we heard the words from you. As you spoke, the mountains fell. The prisoners could leave their cell. And though white noise has filled us too, none could drown the sound of you. As you spoke, I rose from chains. I ran to Jesus once again. And even if my worries grow, and even if my worries grew, I will descry your echoes true. Once daily. They say, take your pills, you'll stay alive. Pay your bills, you will survive. But I'd still, for an elegant high, when life's a thrill and death's a lie. There's gotta be more than the layer of crust while I's under the floor in the gathering dust. Can I fly high or ever learn how? Is death a lie when life is now? I refuse to slow down when I'm careless in speed, cause what if I drown in a hollow of greed? I'd have lived life wrong, so boring and heed, maybe my heart longs for what life needs. And that's where it puts me, where monotony goes beyond. But I believe in what I can't see, and that's a spiritual bond. But I'd like to have a name in a lifetime of thrills, where each day is not the same, and I just take my pills. This is the second poem in the series of four poems about seasons. This one is entitled, Free Light, Summertime. The quick embrace of spring has left this place quite wet, but summer heat is apt to beat in the height of springtime stretch. The hemisphere that lauds it, the season of much fun, frolics, plays, and welcomes days beneath the blazing sun. The clock runs slower, too, as nights burn quick, then gone, setting forth a course towards north to meet the star at dawn. The outside clans and species be those who stay indoors. They take them to their homeland through the forest's many floors. The warmth of summer's lightning, often harsh to us below, is still the reason that this season is greater when aglow. The summer long awaited as the bridge from spring to fall is quite the, the host to those who boast the season's best of all. This is the second poem in the series of three poems about the sun, moon, and stars entitled Satellite. A boundless course is set in motion throughout the newborn skies. If we should stare into the ocean, a post of light may rise. We're granted with another gift when night replaces day. This moon that takes the graveyard shift has agreed to light the way. Along the lines, along the line, it stirs the seas and teases sandy shores, providing us a weightless breeze that trees simply adore. Its phases are a masterpiece, a cosmic work of skill, a body which will never cease, nor void its light won't fill. This poem is entitled Forest Life in Three Parts. This is part one. It never crossed my mind that the world was ever good. It just took so long for me to find, but now it's understood. Forest life perfects its guests and welcomes them with pride. And still it houses all the nests that they have built inside. For city life exists nowhere, even near the jungle floor. I have cast my cares and worries there as I visited before. Part two. The birdies build their homes above, established in the leaves. Within their canopies of love, they're safe away from thieves. The tigers down on earth may prance, their prey may run to hide. They hypnotize them with their dance, where Cory shall abide. The groups of ants all work together to carry forth their plan. They work through foul and unfair weather, unlike the will of man. Part three. And like the city dwellers will, we work not for the good of nature that in time stood still is truly understood. But even so marks sudden proof that we've fallen out of chores that protect and hold the forest roof 
in the jungle of mighty floors. There is more to be done here, here and now, for, all, for no time is left to protect it. We must move with word and heed and had most vow to the place where we perfect it. This is the first part of a poem called Natural Lantern, Virgin Dawn. Part one. A sheet of dew rests on the lawn, a breeze roams through the grass. A feeling of joy will come with the dawn, all day shall not pass. Squint hard, a glow sits on the horizon, a pink aroma surrounds. The morning waits as sunlight flies in, to ignite the climate around. As the day continues to march, so too does the sun. Along its path, a heavenly arch, this body abides to run. Each ray of golden splendor, I'll reach into this sphere. A star that watches as defender against the darkness here. Part 2. Below the mighty troposphere, where weather stirs and stews. A lightning storm is thief of cheer, replacing with the blues. A thousand suns can't break the gray that looms atop the skies. Despite not sending a single ray, the sun still chose to rise. That is hope enough to climb, enough to thank the star. Wherein this body transcends time, this marble travels far. On the good and ugly days, the war still rages on. The sun will rise the simplest way with the virgin dawn. This poem is entitled Running Through a Field. It's the toll of morning's bell that drags me out of bed. The trance of evening spell that messes with my head. It's the sound of forest wake that floods my inner ear. The taste of water's lake that pierces like a spear. It's the span of desert's trace that boggles my small mind. The emptiness of space that nothing is confined. It's the scent of springtime's bloom that piques my nose's whim. The sight of autumn's doom that every year feels grim. It's the singe of summer's heat that burns my naked toes. The bite of winter's sleet that numbs me through my clothes. It's the flight of many feathers that make me face the sky. The march of clans together that ground will catch my eye. It's the softness of the blues that daytime still retains. The warmness of the hues that night's horizon stains. It's the balance of the wild that frees it unconcealed. And I am but a child who is running through a field. The Tranquil Epidemic Silence exists at the tip of our lips when we've got nothing to say. Noise is the sum of a million scripts rolled up in one big play. Somewhere in the basin of stillness and sound, our tongues the fluent committee. The atmosphere of nature around harmonizes with the city. We, a race of contributors to a global array of clamor, are a melting pot of distributors when it comes to words and grammar. Therefore, we must embrace our quiet, spend it wisely like a wealth, we must see it as a mental diet, better in our health. This one is entitled Head in the Clouds. Hurtling through space at an alarming rate, 67,000 miles an hour, and still you think that I am great, although I have no power. Orbiting a gaseous ball of light, a parabolic cirque, but still you think of me as bright, despite my stupid quirks. Wandering through time without a docket, making it all up as I go. But still you see me as a rocket, speeding by you aglow. Trying to live in local headspace while it's tangled in the clouds. And still you wish to see my face, although in mist it's shroud. I think by now I'll live on earth, on safe and steady land. For down here where is you see, for down here is where you see my worth, and still you hold my hand. I dare not get ahead again and leave you to catch up. It's unfair for me to extend and leave you to stretch up. This is called suffocation. I want to hold your breath for you. Your lungs are full of bane. I want to take this death for you so you will not feel pain. I want what's suffocating you, that ocean overhead. I want the poison baiting you to stifle me instead. This one is called Sundial. She realized her watch was broken as she left, as she stepped outside. She turned unto the sun and knew the hour of the day. For unlike those with modern clocks, the dial was her guide. 
Again, the hands of clocks, the hands of sunlight course their way. Far stars past Mars. I've heard that space is empty. There wasn't any hope that we could see in great 3D without a telescope. But I've concluded that if I should visit space, then I should find within my mind that it's the perfect place. So my mind's in action, for I am playful still. In dreams I run beyond the sun, for humans never will. I crush reality. There is no sport of part. Imagination is the station from which I shall depart. I've disobeyed the physics that govern how we act, but there is no friction, only fiction, only fun, not fact. I've broken many barriers, the speed of light and sound. Contending me is gravity, which glues me to the ground. I've seen the colors of the reddest planet Mars. I've stood on things that felt like rings, but took the form of stars. I've reached the outer planets, the Oort cloud even too. The asteroids that fill the voids are larger than I knew. But I have not stopped there. I have endless time and fuel. For only here are limits clear from abiding by the rules. So with imagination, I leave the earth behind. There's so much more we can't explore if the telescope's our mind. This is also a poem. The title of the poem. This is also a poem. It is similar to one I have written before, but yet it is different. It is a poem because it has stanzas, which are like blocks of text, just like this one right here. And this poem is different because the blocks of text, also called stanzas, are different from other poems. I hope this was easy to understand. If you want to read a poem different from this one, read any other poem. This one is called As You Speak. As you speak, we sneak from coves. The outcasts leave their dens and droves. The wise are ties to no more feet and have nowhere they can retreat. As you speak, we keenly dwell. We shed our secrets and our shell. To things of old we won't abide, of things to come we will not hide. As you speak, we breathe relief. Our startled hearts are cured of grief. With sadness gone, our tears employ the chords of gladness and of joy. As you speak, we seek your voice, and with ours gladly we rejoice. And even if our worries grow, there's truth your voice will soon bestow. This one is called The Artist. She sees the world a different way, the vivid colors burst. Her canvas says what she would say if her tongue would speak up first. An artist high on life and hue, her lows are not expressed. And if they are, the color blue would represent them best. Her reds are mighty, green serene, her oranges flood the sky. They are tinges never seen, but surely catch the eye. Her cyan's pop where others won't, her blacks and grays, though pale, tell us stories others don't, and they are quite the tales. Her works are wonderfully devised, one sees the time she, she spends. It's only fair that they are prized by all her loving friends. She sees the world in different light, so bright and full of cheer. Each work of art is clear in spite of all the darkness here. This is the third poem in the series of poems about the seasons, entitled Reprieve, Autumn Time. The torridness of summer has scorched the morning breeze, but autumn's bow will soon allow a coolness in the trees. The beauty much remembered as an ensign mounting tinge plants itself upon a shelf above the pavement's singe. The colors soon will vanish as the earth is littered full, but yet the charm of autumn's arm retains its rhythmic roll. The open fields turn yellow, the farmer earns their yield, and work and play the season stay has made itself revealed. The span of autumn's bantam, though its impact has been made, it's etched in two each day anew, and it will never fade. The fall that's greatly needed as it blinks to heat and frost, is each, year, is each year's jest to take a rest before the freedom's lost. This is the last poem in the series of poems about the sun, moon, and stars, entitled Astral. Council of the night sky, shine bright over our heads. The compass says we might try to travel north instead. Above us we see your show, put on since your creation, a path of golden stars that glow in a thousand constellations. No set of pure bliss than this, a vast array of grace, 
Trillions cannot fill the abyss that we call outer space. You flood the empty black with tiny lights that can't be tamed. No other object is as shiny as the blaze with which you've claimed. Due north is true north. This map has led me here. My compass tells me north. My calendar, I'm pretty sure, is stuck on June the 4th. I've seen this place before. I've passed that sign already. My feet, although they're filled with snow, still seem to be quite steady. How long have I been out, away from warmth and windbreak? My clanging teeth and breath beneath have begun to feel the ache. I've started drawing tallies to track the days I've trekked. I've strand I'm stranded and I'm empty-handed. No one in sight I've checked. Laying down my head seems fitting for me now, but just as I breathe one last sigh, I see a light somehow. For in the misty distance, though sparkle spreads the skies, a lighthouse lies in the horizon before my tired eyes. I rise to meet its gaze, like moth I travel towards, my legs aspire towards its fire until I climb aboard. From there on I was warm, the light was my oasis. I found joy in my in the bounding kin, I found joy in the bounding kin, clear across their faces. I'm through with making puddles as I circle all around. I've ripped apart this spacious chart I've th and thrown it on the ground. My compass still reads north, but now I I'm really there. It's like a slice of paradise that I wish I could share. This is entitled, A Privilege Denied to Many. This number. This number ticks up. One day each year, as time ticks up, one cannot fight its requisition. One must give in. The spirit chose the body to temporarily live in. Age is experience. Age is a story. Age is a timeline of staggering glory. Age is not a barrier. Age is no divide. Age can cross the widest gap and reach the other side. The prior generations have a thing to learn, for as fast as they know it, it will be their turn. They will tie the tennis shoes their relatives once tied. They will wear the pennant their parents wore in pride. This digit, this digit creeps up, but hopefully persistence will try to keep up. The more we try to fight it, the more we grow unstable. If the spirit still resides, then the flesh is still able. This is the second part to In Peace I Will Cease My Speech. If every tree can harmonize the spirit of your praise, and every rock and trilling cries can break the dawn of day, then I have no choice but fix my eyes on you, then mock my gaze. Silence is the perfect time to hear what you can say. And this is the second part to Natural Lantern and Virgin Dawn. Before the natives greet the day, before alarm clocks ring, a tiny light is tucked away on horizon's wing. She rises where the climate's creased, in pure light she is dressed. Each morning soaring through the east, each evening setting west. No man can ban her piercing gaze when she steers overhead. Her blinding and abysmal rays are fierce and stygian red. But her reign is sustained in power, monopolizing light that even in her darkest hour, she still wins the fight. This is entitled Nomads. This is part one. O oh, nomad of the sky, as you come flying by, the trail behind you burns, O oh, mighty arctic turn. O oh, dedicated few, a creature of the wild blue, who roam with quite, help quite frail, O oh, steadfast humpback whale. O oh, clan who herd together, with hooves that aid in any weather. Not a lot are fast as you, O versatile caribou. O insect with much craft, guided by a northern draft. You cannot prosper though you try, O harmless little dragonfly. Part two. A home was built atop these, these, home was built atop these sands. Then cities came and stretched the lands. They essentially were nomads too. We settled once, will move anew. The mountains are still here to rise. The rivers match the bucking skies. Some species ever since their birth were born to trek the rangy earth. And as we humans prove again, we're like these travelers, well then, why are we still sitting down? It's time to leave our towns. 
It's time to hit the open road, for on it we'll make new abodes. We'll never feel like we've departed, for home is always where the heart is. The wild in your eyes. I see the wild in your eyes, the way they pierced is like a dart. The way you smiled with your eyes has touched my stubborn heart. I feel the peril in your breath, the way it issues from your tongue. You are a feral with a breath that matches no man's lung. I sense the fear that you must face, the way it grips your troubled mind. I urge you now to leave this place, run and put this world behind. I see your wild footsteps roam, the way they plant in fields of snow. It is the wild that you call home. It is there that you must go. This one is called Close the Circuit. There's something nice that's thrilling. A chill goes down my spine. A phenomenon that's willing to shake the soul of mine. I love to hear the thunder chase after the lightning's tail. Like a little child under their sibling's shaded veil. The rumble in the distance heard all these miles here makes the sound barrier's resistance seem foolish to our ears. With sound there is no proper way to form a current, for light's the real showstopper unless you get burnt. This is Sustaining Cycle. A symphony of waters march to and from the sky, a cycle soothes it when it's parched, assured and it's not dry. And so it does its root for us, so we too are not seer. Where rain f may fall in drought, and thus it's, it nourishes us here. Before it can descend below, it must transmute to air. Where it will freeze and clouds will grow within the troposphere. But soon the gas condenses keen, and clouds must loose their hull. It causes quite the tonic scene when water starts to fall. Mountains catch its heavy weight, fountains spray it clean. Runoff sprints into a strait to restart the routine. As the, rivers, as the rivers rush about, and lakes scoop up their end, the cycle will endure this route as only it could tend. With nature fed by such a feat, the world is satisfied. In rain and snow and hail and sleet, the earth is never dried. And so our cups are never bare, our wells are never drained. There always will be water there, and we will be sustained. This one is called Someone to Love. I wish I had a girlfriend to tell me of her day, her niceties a slice to free the spirit stowed away. I wish I had a girlfriend to walk the beach together, with barest feet to feel the heat contrast with salty weather. I wish I had a girlfriend to seek no richer prize, to catch a glance of our romance through someone else's eyes. I wish I had a girlfriend to tame my fantasy, to stimulate the love so great between both her and me. I wish I had a girlfriend to laugh and dance and cry with, and if our bond would stretch beyond us dating, then to die with. I wish I had a girlfriend to wear a veil and shroud, so we could never choose to sever the promises we vowed. This is the last poem in the series of poems about the seasons, entitled Retire Winter Time. The counterpoise of autumn has fit the earth for chills. For winter's come to make her numb in valleys and in hills. The ground that's frozen over has chosen death for all. The limbs and leaves are crafty thieves who die before they fall. The evergreens are festive for winter's jest and sport. They flash a peel that matches zeal. No other seat the season cannot thwart. The feet of many feathers and weather bold and brisk form a trace that meets the pace no other race would risk. The cold, though all too nippy, as it falls in flakes unique, brings about a frozen clout the other seasons seek. The winter feared yet favored is flavored with the lure, for those desires dimmed, of, dimmed by fires, cold, act, cold acts as a cure. This one is entitled The Color Orange. Derived from red and, from red and yellow, it's mellow yet it's strong. It's bold enough to bellow its golden nature's song. It yells its tune from cliff sides, and if I'd lend an ear, I'd yearn for orange's pride to turn and meet me here. For orange is but a glow that shows an evening cast, the sun shining below that runs the skyline last. But then it wakes the sparrow with narrowest of beams, 
It pierces like an arrow too fiercely through their dreams. Its autumn's pallid ensued, then you'd see it die. It's bitter in its mood, but sweet enough to cry. Yes, orange is but the stain that trains it as ideal. Its shades have been ingrained and made in great appeal. This one is called One Prickly Pillar. It's an ode to Arizona. Part one. Short, but still quite spiny. We're reaching toward the shiny sky. Inside a liquid slosh is for a native's throat gone dry. A jungle of the cactus plant is fierce to interferes. Warning foreigners outside to not step any nearer. An image of a warrior that battles sunlight stance, providing room within his bloom unlike the other plants. And always it will rise to greet whoever passes through. O cactus of the southern heat, none stands as tall as you. Part 2 I got a picture with a cactus in the phoenix sun. Its mammoth height is why I write a poem for this one. Back home the trees are wonderful, but they are not as tall. They are unlike the plants with spikes. They aren't like them at all. I found it to be beautiful, for in full bloom it was. The other plants cannot enchant, just as the cactus does. I hope that soon I'll see again the structure, the structure stretching high. Alone the life of Arizona exceeds beyond the sky. This one is called One Shining Spire. Whimsical and colorful, piercing through the duller soul, the one the moon cannot. They leave the darker night dust and lasers from a lighthouse, unlike a source that man sought. I've seen them in some movies, but yet I never knew these structures were so grand. I'm a sailor led by fire, climbing to a man-made spire that naturally fits the land. The waves are meant to roll, the grave was sent to snatch my soul, a lifeless form of me. But even I, beneath my breath, can mutter, uttering, O oh death, I'm captain of this sea. Miraculously, I'm not dead. I kept my bow pointing ahead, facing toward the shore. All who made it home tonight, who kept their vessels toward the light, can safely rest once more. This one is called Symbol on the Skin. It's on his chest in colored ink. It's on her arm in red and pink. A vibrant picture it's hard to sink, but it's what the doll coats craved. An artist canvases the skin, like watercolor, still too thin, but just enough to stay within the place it was engraved. These people get the strangest things, like skulls or snakes or dogs with wings, or planet Earth or, or Saturn's wings. They're proud and do not hide it. No marks the same that can't align with anybody's unique design. I often wonder, what'd be mine? What'd be the tattoo I'd get? This one is called Adventure is Out or In There. From the rocky shores of Ireland to the sandy coasts of France. I want to feed your fire and I want to lead your dance. I want to spend this moonlit night in bed in love with you. With vaguest sights and pretty lights in every window's view. But the sounds across the planet bay from Seoul to Singapore. They urge us now to come their way to see what is in store. We'll wander up the lonely trails of Everest or Fuji, crafting more creative tales to reminisce with glee. And then we'll eat the sweet cuisine of Dango and Mochi in Japan, and then the dishes lean, homemade in Ho Chi Minh. Or maybe we will drive somewhere, like NYC or Maine. Our music choice will get us there, much faster than a plane. This is to say adventure waits for those who don't decline, for those who wish to taste the plates that life would pair with wine. But sometimes they aren't far from home, or even far from bed. For others, journeys are at home and not outside instead. This one's called The World in Your Eyes. There's a tiny world inside your eyes, and you don't even realize. The skies are blue and always bright, without a single cloud in sight. The trees provide the lightest breeze that softens mountain tops and seas. The fields are endless in expanse and glisten gold upon a glance. When sunlight hits this mellow gorge, the grasses glow in red and orange. When moonlight strikes this valley new, the flowers grow in solemn blue. This world illumines with a glare. The universe is in each stair. It's like a canyon no one's crossed. It's like a maze in which we're lost. There's nothing that is out of place. 
Your eyes are perfect on your face. Enrapture me and capture me. Sometimes your intriguing jest invites my cultish self to play, and I am but a wide-eyed guest who's summoned here to stay. Sometimes your rhapsodic mood places me into a trance, and I am but a person glued alone to your romance. Sometimes your nostalgic state instructs me to let it go, and I am but the cleanest slate, as clean as pristine snow. Sometimes your assiduous eye catches mine and budges not, and I am but a person high on you in sight and thought. Sometimes your relentless tongue speaks to me in unknown speech, and I am but a student strung on what you choose to teach. Sometimes your undying flame lights the one inside of me, and we are but a force to blame for torching land and sea. Our home. No other place has half the grace that Mother Earth possesses. She's fully ours, the trees and flowers make long and flowing dresses. In regions where the sun isn't there, or so it seems to us, she is still pretty, and in the city she flows her streams to us. Her music blasts through chloroplasts that colorize the sun. The greenest plants and keenest ants praise her endless run. In deserts dry when mammals die, the cactus bears her fruit. Although the water is ever hotter, she sends it through its root. And in the forest, for the florist, she grows all kind of leaf. The prying mind will come to find a world beyond the leaf. And all terrain that go unnamed, the mountains piercing air, the valleys bending and extending, they fall within her care. There is no tribe that we'd describe that she would disregard, no monkeys, birds, or cattle herds that she would never guard. So in this way, on this Earth Day, we must repay her grace. She is our home, our very own. We must protect this place. This is the poem of the book, self-titled poem, obviously called All the Earth and Skies Above. All the earth, a speck of light, amidst a cosmic span of night. Every creature speaking every tongue, come marvel in the wondrous sight. All the skies in grand display, I'll stretch to cover dark and, dark and day. Come out and look up to the sun, and take in every ray. All the earth, we seek your face, becoming unified in space. One people working for their good, to make this world a better place. All the skies, the atmosphere, with oxygen to give us air. You grant us breath to carry on, with taste that's all too fair. This one is about the elements, about earth, wind, fire, and water. The first one is earth. This, the truest element from since the dawn of man, can last much longer than the stronger planets ever can. From her spins the glory of nature, ground, and sky, where harmonies between the seas and land are always nigh. No matter the disaster, tornado, thunder, rain, she dusts herself and trusts herself enough to work through pain. And we have a thing to learn from how she thrives so long, how she takes what makes her ache and use it to be strong. Wind. The final breath of evening, the fresh zephyr of morn, where chanting gases clash with grasses, there a breeze is born. In trees the rustling boughs were shaken to the core, were shaken to the root. The branches flutter, shiver, shudder before they drop their loop. But a northern current's havoc is a southern current's lure. They dance and play the windy way, providing heat a cure. Those who run alongside, attracted to its source, are like the trees that seed the breeze along its destined course. Fire. Inspired by the stars above and what is down below, molten seas of high degrees will find their way to flow. Those who trample over will never know the stake of wading around an underground den of sweltering lakes. Someday it shall surface a lava-laden storm, where ash and rain will cease to wane until the earth is warm. What else could we fear than the fires of the core, where golden flares exist in layers we have never seen before? Water. 
a source of life in purest form, a spring of freshest taste, a squall unlike the harshest strike that we have never faced. Nothing boasts more healthful than a river of its kind, than a tributary running very wild through its wind. Open up the heavens and rain your heartening flood. Set the oceans into motion more than runoff could. No longer will we thirst, for the clouds above are dry. They've emptied down upon our towns. Thank you, earth and sky. This is the final poem, entitled Foreigners, about a hypothetical visit to the planet Mars. This is part one. When I saw that shuttle leave, I wiped a tear away. I heard a couple decades prior about this very day. Curious minds have met the task that others never dreamed of. Colonizing other planets, the celestial above. And that is where we are today, where we'd abound the stars, where Earth could be our second home behind the foreign Mars. But I remained behind because I feared the unknown. I refused to take a step into this twilight zone. After all, our Earth was fine. It always met my need. And if supply should soon deplete, I'll plant another seed. But when I learned about this day, the day we'd venture out, I had no doubt we'd make it there and start to live and scout. Part 2 Days have passed. I've seen the news. The mission has progressed. Thousands are sustained enough to start another quest. As, as long as breath invades their lungs and thoughts raised in their minds, may they be shocked by the enigma of what they come to find. They have the will to search the planet for a source of life, where they may overcome their human, where they must overcome their humanness and their earthly strife. They have the reason to reach out, for if they want to live, they must build their lives around what the planet gives. They have the time to make it theirs, to stretch the trek for years, where they will even change the climate and the atmosphere. Who knows, I may venture too. As bitter as space seems, it'd be a journey unlike ones I've taken in my dreams. Part 3 Cities may begin to rise, streets may follow soon. Crops will find the room to grow against the rigid dunes. Lakes will form and rivers flow, though they were once of ice. And where the air was dusty, it will actually smell quite nice. Storms will shower down their load and do it all again. And when the cycle must return, it empties from the glen. Crystals will enliven caves, the stars will match their candor. Nothing we have ever known is classified as grander. This is Mars in many years, what Earth has yearned to be. This is where we'll, re we'll rest our heads for many centuries. And this is why we choose to dream this far in outer space. This is exactly what we need. This is our kind of place. Part 4 Here I am at 3.03, May 21.49. I'm leaving Earth to visit Mars. I'm told I'll be just fine. I'm still a little nervous, too but I have adrenaline. I've got this look upon my face that tops the biggest grin. I never dreamed of leaving home. That message wasn't subtle, but then it changed when I stepped foot upon this mighty shuttle. I get strapped in and there I sit. I'm ready to embark. I cannot wait to see the light trickle in the dark. I cannot wait to roam as free as I dreamed long ago. For now I have no limitations in what I do or know. Oh, now I hear the countdown start. Then five, four, three, two, one. I believe my eight-month trip has finally begun. That is All the Earth and Skies Above, a collection of poems. All these poems were written over a span of eight, eight to ten years. I spent a lot of time compiling them and figuring out the order that I should put them in. And... I have a second book entitled The Edge of Expansion that includes more poems similar to these about nature, about space, about faith, about death, about life, and about all the troubles and good things about all of those. I may read that on a video as well if I take the time to do it. Thank you for watching. If you watched to the end, 
I appreciate it. Have a good day.